actually know what my title is. Um, I can, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about, oh, I know it's intersections in like pretty crazy generality. Um, it's intersections right, rising from an approach that are started in manifolds and how it really doesn't have anything to do with manifolds. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm sure that's not my title, but it's close enough. Uh, but if you weren't here a second ago, this is just, um, this is a quilt I've made with some undergrads at the University of Kentucky. And I put it up here because it's fun to look at and also to encourage anybody who's teaching algebra to feel free to use this image to show quotients and subgroups. Um, it's on the UK Math Lab website. Um, so feel free, it's fun and colorful. It's a nice place to start. Okay, so the project I wanna talk about today started from what I think is a not uncommon experience where you like read a paper and it really resonates with you for some reason. There's something about it that just really speaks to you. And so you read it and you read it and you read it. And eventually you don't actually need to have it with you to know what's in it. And you keep thinking about it. And you eventually suggest that other people read it. And one of them eventually tells you that the thing that you told them was in it, isn't in it. In my case, this happened with Inbar. Inbar was like, you know, you told me this was in that paper. And it's not. And so you go back and look and you realize Inbar is both right and wrong. It is in there in the sense that the idea you're thinking about came from there, but it is not actually in there literally. So the project I'm talking about started this way. Um, I haven't had this experience with all that many papers, but I had this experience with Klein and Malou's paper on homotopical intersection theory. So what I want to talk about today is how I now think about Klein and Williams homotopical intersection theory and how I think about it as sort of evolving from the original paper. Um, the original paper was very focused on manifolds. Um, and this is true from the, for the, the papers that motivated that paper as well. Um, they were written by people like Crabb and Becker, Larimore, Hatcher and Quinn. These people were all very manifold topology focused. But if you read the paper with the strong desire for the result to be true in greater generality, you can make it happen. So that's what I want to talk about today, is how these ideas really aren't specific to manifolds much at all. They really happen in a lot of other places. So I'm doing this both because I think these ideas deserve greater visibility. Um, it's a really nice clean paper that I'm starting from, and I want people to see that. I'm also sort of hoping that somebody has some weird examples for me. So if you have some weird examples, please let me know. Um, so that's the sort of context for this. So it means I tend to think of this paper as my Klein and Williams fanfic, right? This paper is my Klein and Williams fanfic paper in the sense that this is a pe paper I've taken where I took characters from somebody else and I sort of made them my own. And it feels like the Midwest is absolutely the right place to talk about my Klein and Williams fanfic. So that's what I'm gonna do today. That's what I'm gonna tell you about today. And I wanna start from the place that I started. Um, and I wanna start with the motivation that brought me to this paper. And that's coming from fixed point theory. Um, and I'm gonna quickly leave this, but I wanna give you a grounding in the fixed point theory to get us started. So M, oops, M is gonna be a compact manifold and F is a continuous endomorphism of M. So when I say fixed point theory, one likely thing you're thinking about is the Lefschetz number, which is the sum of the traces with alternating signs of the map induced on rational homology. This is probably a, a likely candidate for what you're thinking about. You might be coming to it from something else, but this is a very likely place for you to be starting. You might also be thinking about um, this as the sum of what are known as the fixed point indices. So X is a fixed point of F and I here is the index. And this is the local sum, like a local sign sum of numbers associated to the fixed points telling you how the map is sort of twisted around them. This is sometimes known as the lefschetz hopf theorem. So this is probably, maybe, considering the audience I'm speaking to, I think this is likely the place where people are coming from. They're thinking about it um, in this kind of way. The starting, so this is sort of the way that like Nielsen theory evolves. Like if you're looking at like Nielsen theory and fixed point theory, it tends to evolve from this starting point um, through like fixed point classes. But there's another way this can evolve and that's through very classical obstruction theory. 
So the idea here, I first saw in work of Fadal and Husseini in the 80s. And the idea is that I could look at, so under the same assumptions as above, really compact manifold is overkill, but we're gonna just go with it. Um, oh, Kirsten, I just saw your thing. I am assuming for this equality, the fixed points are discrete, but what I'm saying, that's a specification because of this particular case I'm talking about. And what's gonna follow in general, I'm not assuming they're discrete. Um, oh, I was saying, I was gonna say how we can think about this as obstruction theory. So I'm gonna say, let's look at map M, mapping into M cross M via the graph. So I'm thinking about this as M goes to M F of M. And I'm asking for a lift up to homotopy into M cross M minus the diagonal. So I'm not asking for a strict lift, I'm asking for a lift up to homotopy. So is there a lift up to homotopy? Now you notice that the lift I'm getting here actually isn't going to be the graph of a function necessarily, right? I'm gonna get some lift, I don't know what it is. Let's, I'm not, let's, let's call it G just for the fun of it. Um, I lift up to homotopy here. So and I'm gonna call the homotopy H. This is gonna commute up to some homotopy H. And then I'm gonna say, well, let's, let's look at a diagram I can build from this, which is M cross I into M cross M by H. And then I'm gonna look at the first coordinate projection and I'm gonna map M cross M minus the diagonal by the first coordinate projection as well. And I'm gonna map M up here, map in over via G. And I'm gonna include as the first, I include at one rather than including at zero in order to make the homotopy match up with what I want. And if M is a manifold, this left, the right-hand map is a vibration. So if M is a manifold, this projection is a vibration. I'm a little annoyed by that hypothesis, but so be it. That's the way we're gonna be. Then this K right here, this gives us the homotopy we need. So this K, if I look at what's happening at zero, is a map homotopic to F with no fixed points. So what I've done here is I've said, okay, this question about is this map homotopic to one with no fixed points really does wanna be a question in obstruction theory. Like this is not typically how Nielsen theory evolves. This is not typically how these kinds of questions evolve, but you can totally study it using very classical obstruction theory. And um, so Fidel and Husseini observed that, yeah, if I look at the obstruction given for this lifting problem up here, I can in fact match it up against more typical fixed point theory descriptions. Um, but what's relevant to me is that I really wanna think about this as a lifting problem where I'm lifting up to homotopy more than anything else. All right, so cool. So we have established that fixed point theory is really a lifting problem. And yeah, we can just ask for lifts up to homotopy because that's gonna actually give us the fixed point free map as long as we're in this manifold setting which again, I'm not thrilled with, but manifolds are a really great collection of spaces. It's a pretty good place to hang out. Now, what I wanna do next is I wanna match this up against more typical approaches to fixed point theory while also retaining this idea of obstruction theory. So what I wanna do now is I wanna to transition to this other idea of obstruction theory, the one that's coming from Klein and Williams' homotopical intersection theory. I wanna make that shift now. So typically when we're looking at, um, ooh, I probably shouldn't say typically. My preferred method of thinking about fixed point invariance, while not the classical one, is to think about the relevant invariance as maps, stable maps from S0 to the twisted loop space of M. So this is paths and M, let's call them paths gamma and M such that f of gamma of zero is equal to gamma of one. 
And I'm thinking about this curly bracket as a very old fashioned notation for stable because it is easy to write down. So this is not sort of the conventional way of thinking about the relevant fixed point variance that generalize the leftist number, but it's a nice, it's a nice interpretation that gives us more power. So I'm gonna think about it here instead. And I'm gonna now rewrite this, a series of transformations um, to give myself something closer to what Kyle and Williams are actually working with. So the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna be fairly dramatic. I'm gonna replace this by fiber Y stable maps. And I'm gonna do that by actually flipping, by changing my target and flipping it half of it over to the domain. So I'm gonna say that this is gonna be the same thing as maps from S0 of M, which is just two copies of M, regarded to space over M by the identity. And one of those copies of M is the section. The pullback of what happens if I take the tangent bundle of M and regard it as a space over M cross M. So this is the tangent bundle. Fiber wise, one point compactified. This is regard a space over M as a space over M cross M. And then I'm just pulling back. So I have one point compactified fiber wise, the tangent bundle. I'm now regarding it um, as a space over X cross X. And I seem to have killed a normal bundle here. What I really did in this step is I first split my tangent bundle and my normal bundle because together they give me a trivial bundle. And when I have that normal bundle in the target, I can move to the source at the cost of replacing it by S0M. And this is, um, this is cost noble Wiener duality. This is a duality in bi categories. Um, very convenient and nice duality in bi categories. Highly recommend. So that's, there's a lot that's going on in this transition. There's a lot that's happening here. I just moved my, um, my classical stable maps into fiber-wise stable maps. This is actually a good idea, um, despite the fact that it feels like I've made things more complicated. Kate, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. The gamma L, um, is, that the, the, is that the sections, like left se sections or to the left copy of M or something like that? Is that what that is? Well, that's just the graph. Oh, that's just the graph. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> this is still the graph. Okay, okay. Got yeah. It. No, 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 sorry. No, 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 just the graph. I'm, I'm trying to be consistent with the notation above, but the other one like flew past. Yeah, it's just the graph. Yeah, is so really- F and not an L? Hmm? Is that an F or an L? It's an L, it's an F, sorry. Okay. It's an F. It's the, it's the original map I had above. All of these are, I'm sad to say, Fs. Lewis, um, who is sitting there in, in this room, can, can confirm that he has suffered with me. And those are always Fs. And yeah, so it's an F. Other questions? So the next thing I want to do that's going to get me sort of away from manifolds, because in some sense, what I'm doing here is I'm undoing the manifoldiness, right? That's sort of really how I think about this is sort of a process of demanifoldizing this. Um, and so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to replace this by stable maps from S0M to the double mapping cylinder. on over the maps to M of the pullback under the graph of M cross M minus the diagonal. So I think in the original Klein and Williams, this is referred to as some sort of Poincare duality, but really it's just recognizing that when I'm looking at um, sort of a complement of the diagonal, what I'm really looking at is some sort of tangent behavior, especially when I'm compactifying um, the complement of the diagonal, I'm really seeing a tangent bundle. So that's what I'm doing here with this one. And the last step I wanna do to sort of de <laughs> demanifoldize this is I wanna recognize it in a range. This is actually the same thing as, as unstable maps. So 
So this is the same thing as the same expression. M cross M minus the diagonal. That should be a square bracket. So I'm using the notation of square brackets to indicate unstable maps. And I'm going to put an M here. And this is if the dimension of M is at least three. And this dimension at least three assumption is just pervasive in fixed point theory. Like this is just, this is just how it is. Um, if you want to, you can use extremely simplicial techniques and avoid it. Um, but otherwise we're just sort of stuck with this. So what I've got so far to recap is fixed point theory is really a question of lift septa homotopy, especially in the context of manifolds. A very classical place to think about fixed point invariant living can be sort of demanifoldized, right? We can move it away from manifold type conditions to just unstable maps. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about this last piece. And I want to talk about showing that the class that you pick up at this bottom, this last place, this last hangout, really is a thing that makes sense it really doesn't care about the manifolds. It's really uninterested in the manifolds. So what I really wanna talk about now is not any of these transitions, which certainly are nice to have in other settings, but I don't know as much about those right now. And instead just talk about why the class you get down here has the property of vanishing when your map is fixed point free. Why that condition actually, why there's an if and only if there. Okay, so the question to summarize is when does map from B into Y into X, which I'm really thinking of as Y minus Q, have a lift up to homotopy? And this is an extremely classical question, right? We all see this question very, very early on um, in our sort of algebraic topology experience. And so what I want to do is, is describe how Klein and Williams approach actually gives a way to answer this question that is not the usual cohomological obstructions. And in fact, everything I'm going to say at this point is now going to be true in a model category. I'm working in a model category simply because it's a relatively low tech approach that gives me exactly what I want in easy to wait, easy to state ways. So it's extremely likely that you have some other way of getting at these ideas. It will just hang out with it. It will just be just fine right on top of it. I'm choosing a model category because it's so easy to state. It's what I'm most comfortable with and it works really nicely here. But I don't think that's a sort of a fundamental fact about this, this sort of setup. Um, the other thing I want to say is that at this point, I'm going to stop talking about sort of the absolute question here, and I'm going to start talking about a relative question. So I'm going to ask about relative lifts. Um, weirdly, relative lifts give you a symmetry that's actually really convenient. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. And so I'm going to rephrase the question, the variant of the question, and I'm going to, again, sort of draw on something that's probably familiar to you. I'm going to look at this diagram. which I'm gonna write here and you're all gonna probably be like, yep, I've seen that guy before. So you, this is the usual homotopy extension and lifting diagram. And what I wanna do is I wanna ask the usual question you ask about homotopy extension and lifting. I wanna ask, when do I get dashed maps? And the motivating example here is what happens just outside the range that you would get automatically get for dimension and connectivity. So just above that usual dimension and connectivity matching range, I'm interested in the invariant that we can produce right there, All right? So we're gonna go from dimension and connectivity matching to connectivity being lower than the lift, the dimension of the, the um, cells we're attaching, All right? But that's the question I'm interested in because this is a question that sort of naturally arises in fixed point theory because it's a really nice proof of the converse. So when do these dash maps exist? 
Well, maybe not when do the dash maps exist, but we're going to talk about an invariant that implies the dash maps exist. So that's what I'm heading for for this guy. So I want a sort of very general statement of this flavor. When can I do this? Now I am going to assume I have cylinders. Um, I'm in fact going to assume, you know, I guess I'm not going to assume too much more about them, but I'm going to assume I have cylinders. All right. So the other thing I want to say, there's a disclaimer I want to make right now. I am not going to state results in their maximal generality. I'm going to state results in a version that is easy to state. So I'm going to make some assumptions about that are sort of overkill. For example, instead of asserting that like all the, for some, I've chosen some particular maps of the diagram commutes, I'm gonna assert that all diagrams where I've chosen two particular maps have a lift or something. So I'm gonna set this up so I have like the easiest to say hypotheses, but you can get by with less. So that's just a disclaimer. As I start making hypotheses, you should be suspicious that I could probably do better. And the answer is I can do better, but it's just too annoying to write. So I'm not gonna do that one. All right, questions. Oh, isn't that I and is that alpha? All right, so I'm, I'm gonna be kind of a terrible person. I'm gonna change my notation for a second. So um, I'm gonna let N of I be the double mapping cylinder. Of say I from A to B. This is a problem because before I wrote it as S sub M, it's really just a question of, of do I want to specify the object or the map? In this case, I want to specify the map. So I'm actually going to be interested in the mapping cylinders of both I and alpha here. They're both going to be relevant. Um, and so in my head, I actually have two pictures of the mapping cylinder. I have both this picture where it looks sort of like a spool with no thread on it. And I have this picture where it sort of fattens out. So they're both going to be useful to have in your head um, because the mapping cylinder is going to be playing two different roles. So it is useful to know. So the first place I'm going to make these annoying hypotheses are if I is a co-fibration and Y is vibrant, the solid parts of the diagram above, this star, I'm going to call it, define a map, which I'm going to call chi. This is a legit sort of use of chi, thinking about this as sort of an Euler class, from the double mapping cylinder of i to the double mapping cylinder of alpha. So in the case where we're absolute, this is just going to be the inclusion of the top and bottom into the mapping cylinder in the target. All right, that's all it's going to be in that case. And I'm just extending over that cylinder in the middle. So this vibrant cofibrant assumption is a thing that we don't see in spaces um, as, as prominently. So there is a map chi like this, which is a legit generalization um, of the Euler class. And we say that chi is trivial if there is an extension of this map over the cylinder. That's what it means for my map to be trivial. I think that's probably not a surprising fact. I mean, that's the thing we can probably all get behind. Ah, questions. Cool. All right, so I'm going to call the next thing a lemma. I feel sort of bad about it. Um, oh, hold on. I need a piece of notation. So we often write a map lifts against the other. We put a little box between them. If every time I have a commuting square where they're on opposite sides, there is a lift. I'm going to use a similar notation here. I'm going to write, so if the dash maps 
and star exist for every choice of the maps that are not I alpha, the inclusion of zero and the inclusion of one, I'm going to write I curly box alpha. So I would type that this is slash curly box. I think that's probably more useful than my bad impression of a curly box here. But it just is saying that if I go back up to my star diagram here, for any choice of sort of the map from B into Y, map from the cylinder into Y, and the lift from A into Z, I get these dash maps. I'm going to write I curly brace A alpha. Again, this is overkill. This is a seriously overkill hypothesis. I'm going to be in a lot of cases that this is true for everyone, but I want something that's easy to state. So I'm going to fix this notation for that purpose. Okay, so now we get to the lemma that I feel bad calling a lemma because it's just so sad, but it's really nice. So lemma, if I do have this property about I and A, I and alpha, then I is trivial. This is basically by definition. Everybody's basically been rigged to make this true. Right? If there is this lift for all possible choices of I and alpha, or these, these dash maps for all possible choices of I and alpha, then my Euler class thing is trivial. Cool. That's a thing that's true. Um, so what I'm actually interested in is the reverse statement, right? This is sort of the easy direction. This is always the easy direction. Um, so what I'm interested in is the converse. And to do that, I need to remind you about the Cartesian gap map. So let's look at the diagram that starts out with A or with X, sorry. And I have my Y and I have my Y and I'm gonna take my two maps alpha. Well, I took the homotopy push out, right? To define my N of alpha. So this is a homotopy push out. And now I'm going to take the homotopy pullback of these, this bottom part. So I'm going to take P of alpha. So P of alpha is the homotopy pullback. Of Y goes to N of alpha. And Y goes to N of alpha. So we've taken our diagram, we've taken homotopy push out, and then we've taken the homotopy pullback. There's a map right here. Let's make it dashed, which I'm going to write as the ceiling of alpha. I am open to negotiation if anyone's offended by that notation and has a better suggestion. Not if you're just offended, but if you have a better suggestion, I'm happy to negotiate. This is the Cartesian gap map. So the ceiling of alpha is the Cartesian gap map. That's just defined by the universal property. So you've probably seen consequences of this because this is actually what's hiding inside of Blaker's Massey. So if you've seen homotopy excision, this is what's actually in there. So classical Blaker's Massey tells us that if alpha is n connected, then the Cartesian gap map of alpha is 2n minus 1 connected. So we get to up our connectivity when we're using the Cartesian gap map. So this is going to be really important that if I can replace my map alpha by the Cartesian gap map, I'm going to have a higher level of connectivity than I had with just alpha itself. So this map is gonna to start to play really important roles as we go forward, All right? So this is gonna be sort of a really central map in what's happening because it's allowing me to increase my connectivity. Um, 
in stable settings, this map is also extremely important and it's much, much nicer. So in stable settings, this is a map you definitely think about and it's a much nicer map there. It's gonna be an equivalence um, because pushouts and pullbacks, how much push pushouts and pullbacks match. Um, but the original motivation is very unstable. Um, so that's sort of the place where this, this shows up most. Um, there have also been some papers in the last couple of years concerning Blakers Massey in much greater generality. Um, I would be very curious if people have really internalized that to, to talk about it, because I, I have not really internalized it. But there are other examples of Blakers Massey, which makes this sort of a more plausible question to look at. Um, people have thought about the Blakers Massey, Massey stuff step separately, separately. So um, there we go. So classical Blakers Massey, Massey tells us we know about this map. Blakers Massey in general is telling you, what do you know about the Cartesian gap map? given things about the map you started out with. That's what a Blakers Massey theorem is, um, at least I think as currently understood. Okay, so now I can actually write down the theorem, actually write down the main theorem here. So the theorem is, and again, I'm overkilling the hypothesis, hypotheses like really hard to get an easy to state statement. So if A is cofibrant, I is a cofibration. So I'm offended because this in particular is going to imply that B is also cofibrant. Fine. We're just dealing with it for right now. Y is fibrant. And I has this lifting property with respect to the Cartesian gap map for alpha. So I have now changed the hypothesis I had before from we're having the lifting property with respect to alpha to we're having the lifting property with respect to the Cartesian gap map of alpha. All right, so this is an advantage. This has actually moved us up a little bit. All right, we are doing better now. And one less hypothesis. And chi is trivial. Then I has the curly lifty thing with respect to alpha. So this is what you would hope for, right? This is sort of exactly what you would hope for is I have now moved my lifting condition. I've broadened the range at the cost of introducing an invariant, but that invariant is not a terrifying invariant. Maybe it's a sort of thing we can, we can get behind. It's sort of a natural generalization of an Euler class. And it exactly tells us when we have triviality, right? So this is sort of the theorem you would hope for. Um, the proof of this theorem is a whole bunch of disassembly and reassembly of diagrams. Because if you think about all the maps involved, there's a whole bunch of homotopy pushouts and pullbacks, right? So if we scroll back up, we start out up here. This map is a map from a homotopy pushout to homotopy pushout. It like begs to be disassembled, right? It just begs to be disassembled. All right, okay, we have a cylinder right here. Okay, that also kind of wants to be disassembled. And one of our hypotheses is a lifting condition where we replaced this alpha by the Cartesian gap map. So we're setting ourselves up with, we're gonna produce a lift, we're gonna disassemble maps in and out of these, these constructions we made using homotopy pushouts and pullbacks. So I, I counted and um, it's 18 diagrams. I did 18 diagrams. So I'm not gonna inflict you that on you. Um, one of the great challenges in writing this up was actually writing it up in a tidy manner. So this proof is a collection. So the proof, we'll put, put proof in quotation marks, a collection of 18 diagrams that disassemble and reassemble 
maps and use the lift, the lifting property for I and the Cartesian gap map of alpha. Um, it's, it's not that painful because everything has sort of been rigged to sort of hang together really, really nicely. But it is a lot of diagrams and that's really what it comes down to. But it is just, it's rigged at this point and everything just falls into place beautifully. So um, this is a thing to, to know if you're looking at the paper. The paper is in fact not that long, it's about 10 pages, um, which I'm pretty proud of honestly, that I got it down to a not too lengthy of a paper. Now, what I wanna do with this last little bit is I actually wanna go back to the topological example. So what I'm really interested in at some point, well, so the motivation for this paper was um, to put out this interpretation of these ideas, but also hopefully put them on a way that, that helps draw more people into them. Because I think this is a really clean way of talking about intersections and obstructions. Um, and so hopefully it can be sort of used in more settings, but I think it's actually helpful also to go back to the topological example and see what this is doing in those cases, um, what this actually looks like. So let's disassemble this theorem and look at it in topological spaces. I would love to have something um, really different and really um, foreign to this example, um, but we're gonna go with topological spaces right now. So let's look at the corollary. Um, and I'm gonna use um, cell complexes as my, um, I'm gonna use cell complexes and Hurevich vibrations, which is like super overkill, but whatever, we're going with it, guys. So we're gonna suppose B is a cell complex and A into B is the inclusion of a subcomplex. So there's the first sort of setup we've got right now. So that's just sort of a translation of our co-vibration conditions. Um, and now we get to sort of make some simplifications. So the first one I'm gonna make is I'm gonna assume that alpha from X to Y is N connected. So at this point, I'm calling back to the classical Baker's Massey. So when I'm making this assumption, I'm calling back here and using this theorem because it's gonna allow me to move myself up to 2n minus one connected, all right? So I'm, I'm calling back to that and that's why I'm making this hypothesis right here. This hypothesis is going to feed this one, right? My connectivity of alpha is gonna feed my lifting condition. And the other part of that that I need to feed that lifting condition is I need a dimension condition on B. So I'm gonna assume the dimension of B is less than or equal to 2n plus one, 2n minus one. And again, I'm not interested right now in this statement and sort of optimizing the this absolute strongest statement I can get right now. I wanna get us back to where we started to get a sense of context. So then theorem is a diagram as in star defines a map chi from the mapping cylinder, double mapping cylinder on I, the double mapping cylinder on alpha that extends over the cylinder of B if and only if the dashed maps in star exist. So notice this really just is a transcription of what happened above, right? This really just is a transcription of what we saw earlier. My cell complex assumptions are to get myself in like an absurdly nice um, setting where I can actually invoke um, classical homotopy extension lifting to give myself stark the, the condition on I and the Cartesian gap map. Um, my connectivity and my dimension put me in classical Lakers Massey. And then I've stated this as, so to sort of include both this lemma above and sort of the theorem in the form I've, I've given it here. 
All right, so they actually include both of them. All right, so uh, notice we are above, so this, this is happening outside of the range that just classical homotopy extension and lifting would kick in. In that case, our dimensions and our connectivity have to match. All right, here we're actually in a shifted range. Um, the other thing to notice is that this is relative, as I've been saying all along, it's not absolute. All right, so I have this subcomplex A that I didn't have. This in some form shows up in homotopical intersection theory too, which is an equivariance paper, which is done inductively. Um, so I think I was also including that in my head when I was thinking it was homo in homotopical intersection theory one. Um, so you can use this inductively, but you can also say, for example, if you wanted to use a, um, an equivariant Laker's Massey, you could then use this theorem sort of all in one go to prove fixed point theorems of the form we saw above. Because equivariantly, you do have all these isomorphisms. So for example, that's a case where you can make this work sort of as it stands. But I really want a weird example. So I don't know exactly what that weird example would be, but if people have weird examples, I am definitely interested. So I'm gonna finish a little tiny bit early and I just wanna say sort of in sort of summary or in conclusion here is that this idea is not opaque. <laughs> this is an approach to um, obstructions and lifting that sort of has very few, mis very few moving pieces. Um, there's very little that's actually having to change you can sort of really clearly see all your hypotheses. And so my hope is that it's really easy to use. Um, the other thing I wanna observe is that every time I made an assumption about co-fibrations and fibrations or about lifting existing for all maps, making some diagram commute, that is overkill. And in fact, if you're looking at the proof of this theorem, you can see at every moment exactly what you need. And one of the real challenges of writing it was figuring out what is a good generality to write in. Because when you're trying to actually keep track of all the data of this particular lift for this diagram, the writing becomes unwieldy really, really fast. But you can see exactly which diagrams you need at every moment, right? Which makes it very nice to sort of control, oh, I only need this. I don't need this whole statement. Um, but yeah, so this is a big ad for this is a, a nice, I think, few moving piece way to get at these kinds of ideas. And I will stop there. Thank you, Kate, and thank our speaker.